Um, there's a mistake in the syllabus. I don't know how I managed to do this, but we're not going to be quite ready to do the problem set tomorrow. So we're going to swap these two, okay, for this week, all right? Um, and there's, oh, there's an experiment this week. So you finally get to use the Stanford, the Stanford Research Systems um, analyzers, the FFT boxes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's good. It's actually two experiments. They're really simple, as you'll see. Okay, so yesterday, last lecture, we, we left off with discussing uh, this electro electro uh, static, so-called electrostatic transducer. It's reversible. Um, <clears throat> it can be a microphone. It's a capacitor type or condenser microphone. It could also be a loudspeaker. It's actually an electrostatic loudspeaker. It's not the um, conventional loudspeaker. And oh, by the way, Kevin has nailed it down. Um, it was a loudspeaker that they used at the Trinity site to pick up on the blast wave. I think they were concerned that uh, any other microphone might be destroyed by the huge shock wave. So, um, yeah. So I'll send out, he sent me a message and with links, I'll send it out later. Uh, okay. So, um, <clears throat> what we want to do, this is very simple. You know, for an electrostatic loudspeaker, if you oscillate the voltage here, you're going to move this, this movable diaphragm or plate here, and it's going to send out sound. If a sound, on the other hand, if a sound wave is coming in, the sound wave will cause this to flex, and you'll see a voltage, a varying voltage across there. So it's, it's qualitatively, physically, it's simple. Mathematically is another matter, okay? And apparently this is the, according to, I looked at a number of books on this, several some years ago this is the simplest example <laughs> of a reversible transducer of a reciprocal transducer we will prove that it's reciprocal okay so you just have to bear with the theory here um, I didn't I modified Brian's theory I, I looked at other books and finally did it the way that I thought was best so here's the idea we're going to define we need to define quantities here we're going to let the zero subscripted quantities here be the equilibrium values. There'll be an equilibrium charge on the capacitor. Oh, this means with no sound wave coming in or you're not driving it w both ways, right? That's what we mean by equilibrium here. There's some equilibrium capacitance, um, equilibrium voltage, you know, across the Q is equal to CV and charge. They'll obey this relationship, standard relationship for a capacitor, the charge is proportional to the voltage across the plates and the constant proportionality is defined to be the capacitance. For a parallel plate capacitor, it's easy to show that this is the capacitance. This is elementary, hopefully all of you have seen this. If you have trouble with it, you can open up any introductory physics book or you can drop by my office. <coughs> uh, D is, we're gonna look, call X the displacement of, the, of this plate, the movable plate. So we don't need a D0 here, so we just call that D, that's the equilibrium value. Epsilon is the, vac is the fundamental constant in electromagnetism, it's the permittivity of the vacuum, called the permittivity of the vacuum. Um, okay, now in equal, let's look at equal, we're going to stick with equilibrium, right? In equilibrium, there's of course no force on this movable plate. There'll be a balance between the attractive, this is equal and oppositely charged, there'll be an attractive force here, electrical force, and it'll be balanced by some mechanical force. Okay, that mechanical force <coughs> will, at minimum, it'll be, um, if this is a flexible membrane, for example, and anchored here, it's going to bend in like this and it'll reach equilibrium. There'll be a mechanical force due to the tension in the membrane that will balance the electrical force here. Um, now, it's going to come up soon, so I might as well mention it here. So we have this, 
transducer here. You can think, think of it as a microphone, or it doesn't matter. It works both ways. And it looks like in equilibrium, this membrane is going to be is going to be stretched in like this. This can be a problem. This cuts down on you, what's called your dynamic range. Um, you won't be able to go to, to, it's going to cut down on the maximum amplitude you can go to before nonlinearities. Hooke's law starts to break down here. So guess what one trick is that people do? This is equilibrium, right? What do you want? You want it to be here, right? Before you put the charge on, make it clunky in another way, and then... Um, that's probably been done, yeah. You can build in, um, you can build in a curvature here. Now that's probably pretty hard to do with a flexible membrane. But in principle, you know, it sounds sounds good. That's, and the that's, other side? This is fixed. This is rigid. This is fixed. They, you can pressurize this, seal this, and pressurize it. Get it over there, right? I've heard that. I've never, I've never seen it. Okay, I don't think. Maybe I've used microphones that have that that's, that are. Uh, the Indefco microphones. No, they have a port. They're. They, um, now, you know, there's a problem with this. If you go, there's a problem with this because this can vary depending upon where you are. Okay, so that's a problem. So the micro, some of the microphones I've used in DEFCO microphones, they actually have a, uh, it's like our eustachian tube here to equalize the pressure on either side. Okay, so you want to be careful, but I just want to point out that there's, you know, different ways of solving problems when it comes to transducers. Um, now I, I got off track. What are we talking about here? Right, okay. So, here's the, um, the equilibrium situation here. And there'll be a balance of forces. But there'll be a mechanical force balancing this, a repulsive mechanical force balancing the attractive electro force and equilibrium. Now, um, I was looking at this and I, I'm going to, and when I edit this, I'm going to change the sign here and then put the negative sign here. I think that's better, okay? But um, it's not important, okay? But, um, and I'll talk a little bit about it later on, but I think that makes it a little clearer. So this just represents the equilibrium balance, okay? And we just talked about this. Now, we're going to let these quantities here, the variables without subscripts, without zero scripts, subscripts, they're gonna denote the fluctuation, the deviations from equilibrium. Okay, so the capacitance will be the equilibrium capacitance plus this C. This represents the changing part when it gets, when the transducer gets hit with a sound wave or it generates a sound wave. And similarly with the voltage and the charge and the displacement, the mechanical force, okay, and the electric force. Those all denote the fluctuating values, the deviations from equilibrium. That's very convenient here, and you'll, you'll see how, how convenient it is in a moment. Um, <clears throat> the textbook, I don't, I don't know why Brian did this, I think it's just a mistake. He defines C and Fe as the total values, okay? We're not gonna do that. The total capacitance, we're just gonna simply write it as, as this. We won't give it a, a particular name, will just recognize that this is the total capacitance. The equilibrium part plus the fluctuating part. So be aware if you compare this to the book. And I've, I, and I've deviated in other ways, like I told you from his derivation anyway. Okay. So, um, here's what happens. We're actually, let's look at the, here's the total inst instantaneous capacitance, right? Here's the fluctuating part. This is constant. We simply take this, the capacitance formula here for a parallel plate capacitor, we replace the equilibrium value with D plus X, right? Where X is the fluctuating displacement from equilibrium. And now I want you to look at this. This is not linear, right? We, we're only gonna be interested, we're interested in linear transduction here. So this variable X here, we need, um, we need to, this is nonlinear, we need to linearize it. And we do the standard thing um, 
it's nice to it's nice to go dimensionless here. I usually do this. I fact I factored out a d here, right? To going from here to here. That's all I've done. And now one over one plus a small quantity is what? One minus a small quantity, right? Okay, that's you can think of that as either a Taylor expansion. You can get or from the binomial expansion. They're equivalent here. <coughs> So we make this approximation. We're only interested in relatively small displacements here. So you know, this, what this tells you immediately is this is a nonlinear transducer. And if you drive it too hard or, or it gets driven too hard, you're going to start to see nonlinear effects. So here it is linearized. Now if we look at, if you compare the first and the last terms here, what's the fluctuating capacitance? Well, it's just equal to this. See? See, now these cancel. We get that the fluctuating capacitance is equal to that. We'll need this later, so that's why I underscored it there. We can do the same thing with the um, electric force. This is the instantaneous electric force. It's the equilibrium part plus the fluctuating part. Okay, and again, I'm going to go through and change this, the sign here. I think it'll be better. Um, the force, oh, I didn't comment on this. The force on a capacitor plate for a parallel plate capacitor is the electric field times the charge on the plate. The force is the charge times the electric field. And for a parallel plate capacitor, this is what it is. Okay, so this is um, elementary. And again, you, know, you, can f you, should, sh you should be able to find it in any, in any introductory physics book. Or you can come by my office if you have trouble with it. Uh, so again, for the instantaneous value, we replace the equilibrium value with the total instantaneous charge, which is Q naught plus Q. Again, it's nonlinear. What's one plus a small quantity squared? It's one plus two times that quantity, Taylor expansion. So I've made an approximation from going here to here. And then again, we identify the fluctuating electric force as this term multiplied by that. So again, we're going to need that later. So there it is. Uh, don't worry about, I'm going to kill this. I'm going to edit this out. Don't worry about that. Okay. So the next thing to notice here, and um, I think we've already seen this, and we're going to see it many times. The electrical, so we want to be general here, because ultimate goal of trans, transduction is, you know, to build a transducer or modify an existing one or, or understand a commercial one. You know, it's a practical, it's, it's, it's this bottom line, this goal of, of, that's very practical. So the electrical circuit can have some inductance and can have some resistance. So we're going to go ahead and include that in our theory. Okay, to be able to handle it. Uh, similarly, the, the diaphragm, it will have some mass it'll, and it can have some mechanical resistance, okay, and some um, stiffness. So we'll include that, include that in the theory. So when we do that and we look at the electrical side, we look at the electrical look at the electrical aspect of the transducer here. Kirchhoff's laws lead to the, um, lead to this equation. Now, this is not identical to the, you know, summing the voltages going around the circuit, okay? I've just done some, I've moved things from one side to the other. And this is a, it's, this is convenient. This is, you can see it's starting to get complicated. So it makes life easier if you can, if you display things in a, you know, a better manner here. So what I'm, doing here, and this is the way I usually like to think of this stuff anyway, and we've talked a little bit about this before. There's some, think of, think of this as a driving voltage, or it could be a response voltage. And that's going to be the sum, that voltage will be the sum of the voltage drops across all the elements. So here, if you want to think of it from this point of view, all of this stuff is on this side of the equation, but it's all going to have minus signs here. Because the change in, we've got a, a, a change in voltage here in the driver of the response. The potential difference across an inductor is minus L times di dt, right? That's the potential drop 
That's the change in voltage when you go across an inductor. So I've moved it over to here. You bumped the mouse, actually. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. Thanks. So, and of course the current is the rate of change of charge with respect to time. So I'm sticking with the charge right now. I don't want to introduce another variable, okay? So I'm gonna, this is gonna be the second time with respect to Q, right? And I've got a plus and I moved it over here. So the voltage here is the sum of the voltage drops. That's the way I think about it. So here's the drop due to the inductor. Here's the, the um, resistor. It's the current times the resistance. And here's the capacitor. Okay, which is the charge. Q is equal to CV. So the voltage difference there is the charge divided by the capacitance. And I, wh what do we do with this? It's not linear. We've got to linearize it. Okay, so we'll do that in a moment. Let's look at the mechanical side here. Um, now there is a, if you <laughs> don't look at the revised notes, if you use what's in here, there's a mistake here. You need to change the sign you need to put a minus sign right here. Okay, this is one of the reasons I realized. Okay, so if you wanna, if you're not gonna pay attention to the revised notes, you, there's a mistake here, you wanna put a minus sign there. Okay? So mechanically, we have F is equal to MA. Here's the total force, there's this mechanical force, there's an electric force, mass times acceleration, Damp these, these forces are actually over here and they have minus signs in front of them. I just moved them over here. You've seen this before? Okay. We've got stiffness and we've got damping. So uh, this is linear, but this is not. So we need to linearize that. So we do the same thing we did before. <coughs> Here's the total instantaneous charge divided by the total instantaneous capacitance. Go dimensionless here. This is one plus a small quantity. One plus a small quantity. We leave this. 1 over 1 plus a small quantity is 1 minus the small quantity. And now when I multiply this out, I get the DC term here, a 1. I'm going to pick up this. I'm going to pick up that. What happened to the product of these two? Why is it not there? It's so small. Right? Yeah. This is a small quantity. This is a small quantity. The product of two small quantities is negligible. It's higher order, second order. We neglect that. We're linearizing. <coughs> okay. So, now, um, you can show, and this, this has to be true, if you neglect, if you look at all the constant terms here, what we call the DC part of this equation, this is a DC term, this is AC, right? Um, this is all AC. There's gonna be a DC term here, here it is. The DC terms will all cancel, that's because what we're doing is we're specializing these equations to equilibrium. And we've already taken care of equilibrium. That's what we, the first thing we did. We wrote down the relationships for equilibrium. So for example, you'll see here that if I look at just the DC terms here, I get a V naught here. Over here, the DC, I just get a Q naught over C naught. Well, we know that V naught is Q naught over C naught. We know that Q naught is equal to C naught V naught. That's equilibrium. The same thing happens down here. The DC terms will cancel. And here's what we're left with. Now, I don't know if you noticed it, but we're kind of edging toward now the canonical form. Remember the way back? We're headed towards the canonical form here, so we can identify our tr transduction coefficients. And we'll also be able to, the impedances too. Oops. Okay. So to get there, uh, oh, first, we should substitute our expressions for the fluctuating capacitance and get, get these, we want to get these down to canonical variables. So those under, underscored expressions that I had, we substitute those expressions, okay? And also at this point, <coughs> we want to go to current because that's a canonical variable. So we replace Q with I over current I over imaginary I omega, right? And similarly, we replace X with U over I omega. Okay. And we do, oh, there's also some, um, it's, it's obvious. 
What's, what's this term? What's, two t what's a time derivative on this? Zero. Zero. So that goes. So there's some simplification, some you know, really simple simplification that you do here. So here's what we, here's what we get. We get this, and now I'm going to add. I'm going to um, add this. You'll notice to achieve the uh, canonical form, we want to group for the voltage. We want it to be something. It'll be the impedance, the electrical impedance times the current. So we factor out an I here, the current I. We leave this for the force. Um, <coughs> we factor out the U. And what, what it gets multiplied by is the mechanical impedance. Up here, it's the electrical impedance. So if you stare at this, you'll see, and I'm going to help by writing this, simplifying this a little bit. Here's, we actually have achieved the canonical form in terms of the voltage and the force and the force on the left-hand side of the equation. And then these, what we think of as, for convenience, as independent variables. But, you know, what you choose as independent variables doesn't matter, right? But here we choose that it's chosen to be, for the purpose of dealing with impedance, it's chosen to be the current and the velocity. And now we can identify our impedances here and the transduction coefficients. And you'll see that the electrical impedance is this, the mechanical impedance is this, and this is well known for series electrical and mechanical circuits. This is going to be the, um, the impedances. You're well familiar with this, right, from 3119. Right. It's not 3991. Okay. Yeah, I get those. We have a 3991. How many people took that? Okay. <clears throat> it's a, a math methods course. All right. And now, what is the main point here? It's not the whole point. You know, we're, we're doing this just to gain experience and like that. But the specific point we're after is compare the two transduction coefficients, TEM, TME. You see that they're the same. Because they're the same, we showed yesterday, that means uh, an equivalent electrical circuit will exist. So this is a, called a reciprocal transducer. It will obey reciprocity, and there'll be an uh, equivalent electrical circuit. <coughs> now, just a, a little, some notes here. Uh, oh, people often use the word symmetric here, and um, which I don't think is going to cause you any trouble, but I just wanted to point out that sometimes it's convenient to use a, a big vector matrix approach here. Well, I'll go ahead and write this out as TEM, TME, G mechanical, and then our variables here are current and velocity. So we can write our canonical equations obviously in matrix form. So you can see that when we have a reciprocal transducer, when TEM equals TME, we have a symmetric matrix. So that's why people use the word symmetric here. Now, for, from a practical point of view, usually with a transducer, you want the transduction coefficient to be as big as possible. You want to be able to easily transduce. Um, because there's going to be noise present, <clears throat> and the bigger signal, transduction signal you have, you know, there's going to be noise coming in after that signal. There's also going to be noise as part of the signal. but to beat down the noise that comes in later. You want, to, you want this to be as big as possible. And this, this, is, uh, this is kind of interesting here. You'll see that um, you want the charge on the capacitor to be as big as possible. That's very reasonable, right? When the charge goes to zero, you're not going to have any transduction. So what limits this? How big, can you just make this arbitrarily large? Now eventually you'll have arcing. You'll break down that air or something. So how do you defeat that? How do, how's one way, how, what is one way that people do? You guys know this? I, I've, again, this is something I've heard. I've never seen it. How do you defeat, you know, we want to be able to put more charge on there beyond that which would cause breakdown of the air, arcing. What can you do? 
Uh, I think it's sulfur hexafluoride. Yeah, it has a high breakdown constant. So people, you know, I've heard people have done that before. Uh, you'll notice the frequency. This bothered me. I remember the frequencies in the denominator. So the first thought is, oh yeah, at, at higher frequency, you you got this moving mass, this diaphragm. The higher the frequency, the, the less the amplitude is going to tend to be, just by Newton's second law. And it's going to require a much bigger force to keep it up at its displacement. So this is a standard thing that uh, at higher frequencies, the amplitude will, will go down. But there's no mass here. The mass is not in there. So this frequency actually comes about by our choice of variables. <laughs> you know, um, our canonical variables being I rather than Q. That's how it comes in. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so the fact that this <coughs> looks like, the you know, fact that this is going down with frequency is not necessarily a bad thing. <coughs> it's just a reflection of our... Um, our choice of variables. So it may not represent a fundamental degradation of the transducer. You just have to, you know, deal with it in your application. So it may, it may not be a problem. Um, okay, any questions about that? We will do an example of this in the spherical geometry. Uh, for a spherical geometry, we'll do that in the problem set. And that could lead to an interest to a, uh, an interesting demonstration. And um, I don't know, it may not work, but we'll have theory to guide, and <coughs> this is gonna be part of Faisal's, we plan this to be part of Faisal's thesis. <coughs> we'll use the theory to guide us. We'll probably plug in some numbers rather than just throw together a, this thing and just pray, hope that it'll work, right? So, of course, that's more a big advantage of theories. Okay, so the electrostatic case is an example of a reciprocal transducer. The other, another possibility is what's called anti-reciprocal. We discussed this a little bit. And um, <clears throat> here's a standard example. We go to the electrodynamic case, okay? And remember, this has a, specifically refers to something here. It's a conductor moving in a magnetic field. So here's the, here's the simplest case. Imagine you have this um, conducting rod here, and it's constrained to move in one dimension, okay? To move back and forth this way. Uh, you have electrical leads here that are, you know, it's on, that you somehow are connecting here, okay? Remember, we, we need to allow this to be able to move. And it's in a uniform magnetic field that's pointing perpendicular to it this way. So the motion is this way. The magnetic field is perpendicular to the motion and the rod, it's pointing this way. So if I put a current through here, what happens? Here's our positive direction of the current. Let's say we have a positive current going through here, okay, what's going to happen? We have a current in a magnetic field, right? There's going to be a force. Which way is the force? This way. And we're going to call it the positive way. So, if we pass a current through here, it's going, let's do it in three, dim three dimensions. The current's going this way, the magnetic field's this way. To take IL cross B, the force is going to be that way, okay? On the other hand, suppose we move it. Now, hook this up to an oscilloscope, okay? We're not going to drive it here electrically. We're just going to de detect it there. If we force it this way, if we move it this way, now what happens? Well, there are charge carriers in here. And they're in motion. They're moving this way. They're in a magnetic field. They're going to feel a force. A positive charge carrier in there, moving this way, in the positive, moving in, in the direct, you know, for the positive displacement of the rod. The, the magnetic force is Q V cross B or Q U cross B. Okay, so. Um, 
Where, where's the force? Yeah, it's this way, it's in the negative direction. Okay, so that'll come up in a moment. But for right now, just make sure you understand here is that when we, this is a transducer, so it's a reversible transducer, as we, we, and we discussed this before in connection with the loudspeaker. And I was thinking, this should be shown before the loudspeaker. But then I finally realized, we had, when we showed the loudspeaker, there were two carts in here full of demonstrations. I don't think I can get three carts in here. So, <laughs> so we'll settle for doing it later, okay? But ideally, it should have been done before the loudspeaker, because this is basically what's going on in a loudspeaker. <clears throat> and a loudspeaker can act as a microphone, right? And has, okay? <laughs> Um, all right, so let's demonstrate this here. Um, here are the pole faces of a magnet. This is the north pole, this is the south pole. The magnetic field is going this way. I'm, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put current through here, and I've hooked this up to a power, DC power supply. The current is going to go this way. The magnetic field is this way. So the force is where? It's this way. It should kick out, and you see that it does, right? Now I've turned it off. And it's just going to oscillate down. There's no, no drive or anything here. It's just damping out. I turn it on and I kick it out. If I reverse the current, it's going to go that way. And I can reverse it by changing these leads there or here. We don't need to do that. Pretty obvious, right? What's more interesting is this. I'm now going to take our leads here. So this is you know, acting as similar to a loudspeaker. Now what I'm going to do is take the leads and put them in this Stanford preamp here. Have you guys used these before? Uh, do you need to see the front end? They're extremely heavy. You guys, I, I can't live without, I literally cannot live without these. These are low noise preamplifiers and they're worth the $2,500. As long as it's not your money, <laughs> as long as the taxpayer's money. Okay, these things are excellent. They, they're incredible. I usually do not do this demonstration. I have to be careful here. I'm gonna. I usually don't use it for this demonstration, just to make it, you know, not to complicate the demonstration. But um, there, I was having a lot of noise here, so I'm gonna send the signal instead of sending the signal directly to the oscilloscope. I've got this in between here. It's acting, uh, it's amplifying, but it also has built-in filters, so you can filter out some higher frequency noise. Or it is, you, can, you can operate as a bandpass filter, you have the freedom to do that. And uh, I was getting too much noise, so the first thing I did this morning was, what did I do here? Is this normally the way these wires would look? This is called a twisted pair. What's the purpose of a twisted pair? Yeah, what, when you have just these two wires as a loop here, that's an antenna. It's called an inductive antenna. And you have a fluctuating magnetic field going through there. It'll induce a voltage. That's a, that's a primary source of noise here. So this cut down on the noise a little bit by going to a twisted pair, okay? Because I've got essentially no, very little area now. And that still didn't work enough, so I put this, and now it works, it's great. I think. So let's look at this. We're not going to think of this as a microphone, okay? And here's our mechanical excitation here. Okay, so you see the oscillations. Now look what happens as the amplitude goes down. They're highly nonlinear, but this is kind of interesting. Look what happens as the amplitude gets smaller and smaller. As, it's almost like magic. What kind of wave is that looking like now? A sinusoid. Yeah. So you, it's going linear, right? At these small amplitudes here. You should be able to still see some. Now you see noise is pretty is starting to dominate, right? <coughs> so we need to make a video of all this. Okay. Any questions or comments about that um, demonstration? This is noisy. I'm going to turn it up. We don't, I don't think we need it anymore. Okay. Okay. So here's how we're going to approach this. This is this is simple. Okay. 
We can make it even simpler here. We're going to have an electrical side to our transducer here. And in fact, for right now, let's block it. That means no mechanical motion. U is equal to zero. Purely electrical, right? What will we write down for this equation? Well, when it's blocked, the voltage will be the impedance times the current. And we can include whatever impedance, they'll be just in there, whatever we've got. Inductance, capacitance, whatever, resistance is all in there, okay? Similarly, on the mechanical side, for, for it being purely mechanical, or it's not actually right to say it's purely mechanical. There is electrical stuff going on, but it's really having no consequence. That corresponds to no current. That's analogous to no velocity. When there's no current, we open the circuit, okay? So it's essentially purely mechanical. We have Newton's second law. And here is the impedance version of Newton's second law. Okay, for at, at a certain, at a, de, at a definite frequency omega, in general the impedance will be a frequency omega. So it's much easier dealing with this, you know, this is why we use equivalent circuits. Much easier dealing with this, which really comes from circuit theory, rather than Newton's second law, but it's equivalent, okay? Now, but what happens when we have some, uh, what happens when we allow, let's say, um, let's look at this, let's look at this one first. Let's allow some current now. Well, if we allow some current, there's going to be now a magnetic force in addition to a mechanical force. So I've uh, got some current in there. We just argued that there's going to be a force in this direction. And the magnitude of that force that force is just given by, here it is in general for a straight wire, it's just going to be ILB or BLI. The magnetic field times the length of the rod times the current. And this is valid for a uniform magnetic field. So this is the elementary force on a current carrying straight rod in a uniform magnetic field. And we, everything's at 90 degrees here so we don't have to worry about the cross product. This is just as simple as it can be, except for zero, except for the trivial result of zero. So, we generalize this equation by simply adding this term here, okay? Now we've got to do the same thing on the other side, all right? And now, <coughs> what we're doing now is we're allowing some motion. Once you have that motion, there's going to be a force on the charge carriers. And you remember, that's going to cause... Um, that's going to cause a voltage in the opposite direction. Remember that? We just, we just went through that. So the voltage here is, uh, the voltage is the force per unit charge. So that we take the magnetic force on a charge carrier here, we divide by the charge, The electric field is the force per unit charge, right? The electric field is the force per unit charge. The voltage is the integral, is the electric field times the distance. So um, the voltage or the EMF is going to be the magnetic field times the velocity. The charge is over here, that's how we got the electric field. To get the voltage we need to multiply by the distance which is L. So we generalize our equation like this, and we got the minus in there because it's going in the opposite direction. And now what do we have? Just to summarize, this is what we have, and now what do you see here? What kind of transducer is this? The transduction coefficients are equal and opposite, so that's called an anti-reciprocal transducer. An equivalent electrical circuit does not exist. And equivalent, electro as I told you before, they're so important in a transduction that people make this work. They make, the, <laughs> they, they force an equivalent electrical circuit. So there's, what's the trick there? Well, we'll see. We'll see um, soon, uh, tomorrow or then our next week. I can't remember. We'll be able to overcome it. All right, so this is actually a pretty simple example in contrast to the electrostatic case, which required all that math. And, you know, one of the big reasons is linearity. This is naturally linear here. Now the demo is not, okay? Why is this so nonlinear? Well, it's not a uniform magnetic field, right? Unless, until it gets way down in here like this. 
That's why it went linear. We've got sinusoidal oscillations. But in, you know, in general, it's highly nonlinear. But our theory here, we just assumed a constant magnetic field. And you can see that's, what, that's the main reason that this is much simpler than the electrostatic case. We don't have to worry about that. Okay, so the next topic here, we'll start this and we'll finish it tomorrow, is getting into these equivalent circuits for reciprocal transducers. Okay, we know that one has to exist, and it turns out it's not just one. There are probably infinite number of electrical equivalent transducers, and you might think, well, just, you just need one. You know, well, unfortunately, it's not that simple. Depending upon what you're doing, some equivalent electric circuits. So we have this trend. Let me back up here. We have a transducer. Okay, there's a conversion between electrical and mechanical energy. We want to come up with an equivalent electrical circuit that describes that, and then we deal with Kirchhoff's laws. That's how we deal with a transducer. Okay, it's completely electric. Uh, and it's equivalent to the trans to the electromechanical you know transducer. How do we come up with an equivalent electric circuit? We're gonna that's part of the discussion. But another thing I want to point out here is that it's not unique, and depending upon what you're doing, some equiv one equivalent circuit will be more convenient than another. Okay, so you can only learn this by experience. But I just wanted to tell you right now. So that's why there are what I, sometimes, what I call the infamous five. So there are these five circuits here. These are all equivalent. There's, this has the same information as, as the canonical equations for a reciprocal transducer. See, we've set the transduction coefficient before. Here's a schematic. This is just a schematic. It's not explicit. Okay, I, I'm not, if that works for you, fine. I don't know. But those five circuits that I just showed you, they're all the same. They're, they're equivalent, believe it or not, and they're equivalent to this, to this transducer. And they, they're very different. And when I first saw this, it just completely blew me away. It, it, I, it, it's just, I just couldn't believe it. So I, fi I just kept working on it, finally, after a fairly large amount of time I, I realized that, you know, that, yep, the book is right, okay. And this is standard stuff, okay. This is going to be in all transducer books I, in one form or another. So, um, let me make a comment here before we get into this. We're going to eventually, I think, prove that all of these are all equivalent to each other. We're going to eventually prove that. Um, I think one may be part of a quiz. I can't remember. One's a homework. We're going to do, today, we're just going to do the first one, right? But before we get into it, I want to point something out here. You'll see, um, you know, minus T, minus ZE. What's, what's a negative impedance? Well, there's nothing wrong. It may be hard to do that, to imagine that physically. Um, but mathematically, there's, there's really no problem. A negative impedance just means, you know, for example, when we have the, uh, it's easier to write u is equal to zero. When we have the transducer blocked, you know, we have this simple relationship, right? If we imagine ZE going to minus ZE, it just means that the voltage, the, the potential difference changes sign. So mathematically, there's nothing wrong with that, and we need it. We need to use it here. Physically, it it would looks like it'd be a lot of trouble. It looks like you'd have to build something very elaborate and power it to, to do that. Okay, in general, I don't know, but um, for us, it's just it's, math, it's mathematically permissible, and we really need to use it. You can see that it's all over the place here. So let's look at the first one first we're going to prove that this is equivalent, this circuit here, this is a fully electrical circuit, and we'll prove that it's equivalent to our reciprocal transducer. 
that's equivalent to this. So we need to prove that we get these, we need to use Kirchhoff's laws and show that we get this. Now, the first tendency of physicists is, well, we've got a current here and we have, a, which is essentially, now, for right now, you'll, you'll say, wait a minute, this is not electrical because that U, that doesn't, that doesn't have the dimensions of current. Don't worry about that right now. We'll, take, we, we'll have to take care of that, but it's not a problem right now, okay? And we'll, and we'll talk more about it um, tomorrow. So just pretend this is an electrical current. Physicists tend to say, well, I, I've got this current, I've got this. This is the chosen to be the positive direction. The current through here will, well, I think what physicists do, they just call it the sum. It's obviously going to be the sum. So we've imposed Kirchhoff's junction rule, right? Another thing sometimes the students do is they'll call this an, an, another variable, like I prime or something like that. We don't want to do that. We don't want to introduce variables here if we don't have to. We're going to be encountering this so much that we don't want to think of this like physicists. We want to think of it like engineers. We want to use what engineers call mesh currents. Maybe some of you have seen this before. So in order to reduce the number of, to make it easier to deal with circuits, to apply Kirchhoff's laws, you have this sum, you know, it could be a quite a complicated network. You assign currents in a counterclockwise way. So this would be this would be the positive direction I2, this is the positive direction of I1. And then the voltage drop going from here to here, the, the potential difference, the drop going this way. Okay, so it's negative the potential difference going this way. The voltage drop across the impedance here is just going to be this times the current. You can see the current is I2 minus I1. All right? So um, one of the reasons this is done is we don't want to assign a different unknown here. All right? We want to just want to put that in. Now in our case, in the transducer case, we define our positive directions to be like this. So we have to change the sign of I1 so we get that. So routinely what we're going to do here when we see um, a situation like this, Okay, we want to apply Kirchhoff's rules. We're just going to call, we're going to recognize that the, the voltage drop across here is the impedance T times the sum of the two currents. So now I use the loop rule here. What's the equivalent um, impedance here in series? It's just ZE minus T. So the voltage here will be the sum of the drops going around this loop. The drop here is ZE minus T times the current. The drop here we've already seen is, this, is I plus U times T, right? And that has to be balanced by V. So you want to get used to this because we're going to be doing this a lot. So here's what I get with a loop rule. And you know, do you see we can simplify this? This term cancels that term. All right, and we end up with this. And V equals that, does that look familiar? That's the first canonical equation. Right, so we verified the first one. You can also go through, it's very easy to do. We now look at this loop. We look at this loop over here. This, we think of this as a voltage, this force here. It must be equal to the sum of the drops. I get a drop of a Zm minus T times U here, and here we get the what we had before, the sum of the currents times that. And now we balance that using its Kirchhoff's loop rule, and we get this, and now this simplifies, and now you see the U terms. These two U terms cancel, and we get that. So we just showed that this is an equivalent electrical circuit to our reciprocal transducer. This is an equivalent electrical circuit. And we can get some mileage out of this, but ultimately this is going to fail us. Because ultimately we want to know what these velocities are going to be. And now we've got this problem because um, this is not a genuine current. So that's one of the reasons that we have these other equivalent circuits is to handle that problem. 
So tomorrow what we'll do is, well, I don't know, I haven't looked ahead, but we'll probably, I think we'll launch off, oh, it's next appropriate, whatever, I think it's actually appropriate to do this one next. Yeah, to stay away from the transforms, yeah. So we're going to do this one next, we'll show that this is equivalent. And now, just to look ahead a little bit, you'll see that we've had some normal, some normalization has occurred, has mysteriously occurred here. We'll talk about that. But you can probably guess what this means. What's this quantity going to be here? And this, this quantity. This is going to be a genuine voltage. This normalizes, scales the force, the newtons, to volts. Um, and then we'll talk about the need for transformers later, also, also tomorrow. Okay, any quick questions? All right. Mm -hmm.